Welcome to our very first event of 2022. I'm Karen Simpson and president of the Lean in Toronto Network. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we were on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. As seen in Toronto, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I encourage you to acknowledge the land you sit on in the chat this evening. Kimichwich meaning big thank you. The Lean in Toronto I'm, team I'm so proud of consists of 32 volunteers committed to role modeling, women supporting women, diversity and absolutely everything that we do and creating inclusive programming to help women be unapologetically ambitious in career and their life. I hope you've all heard about Lean in circles. There are over 40,000 circles globally across 160 countries. Circles are typically a group of eight to 12 women who meet monthly for support to develop their skills, mentoring and networking. There are also corporate circles and the numbers over the pandemic have grown exponentially with corporate circles. They're a great way to develop your leadership skills. So if that's your goal for 2022, I encourage you to start up a circle. There's amazing content online. You could have a meeting every month for the next three years without having to dig in too deeply on what that meeting might be about. Just put a note in the chat. The team is happy to help you start your circle, or if you're wanting to participate in an existing circle, we can help with that as well. Toronto at leaningcanada.com. Now, last year, our team came up with a goal where we wanted to provide a formal opportunity to help male allies develop. And we and it clearly went to lean in circles. We created a male ally circle. I'm very happy and thankful to have Brandon Davis, who you'll see on the panel tonight, and also Richard Cornwell, who co-led the creation of the male ally circle. So for about seven months now, them and 20 other men have been meeting pretty much on a monthly basis. I'm so encouraged. I've attended most of the meetings to see them helping each other become male allies, sharing their stories, doing pre-work, coming to meetings with that. Anyone on this call who's um, looking for an opportunity to get involved more with male allyship this year, help us break the bias and the arm signal is this. That is the theme this year for International Women's Day, which is March 8th. The team is happy to help you with any of these opportunities. So just put a note in the chat or send an email to info at leanincanada.com. Now let's kick off this event. Kiki Loy or Yure Day. Oh my goodness. I was so impressed with her right from the very first opportunity we had to speak about three years ago. She was a student, an international MBA student at Schulich at the time. In fact, she was one of my first recruits when this team started in 2020. And she co-leads our community partnership and sponsorship team. Kiki is an international commercial lawyer who came to Canada to pursue her MBA and also became a campus ambassador for women, receiving an award for diversity, belonging, and inclusion. After graduation, very thankfully, Kiki decided to stay in Canada and currently works with RBC in their wealth division. Kiki is absolutely passionate about her female on empowerment and gender equity. Not only a teammate, she actively mentors within our team and beyond. She recruited male allies. She kicked off the male ally circle last June, and I just know she's going to bring all of herself to this conversation tonight. We're fortunate to have her moderation skills. Thank you, Kiki. Thank you, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. Like I said earlier on, you have a way of always making me smell like roses. Um, it's been great growing professionally and personally alongside you. Thank you for all of the energy you bring to our team. Um, my name is Kiki, like Karen has shared with you all, and I'm a member of the Lean in Toronto team, where I serve as co-lead community engagement and partnerships. Special shout out to the LIT team, as we like to call ourselves, for your support and for pulling this event together. 
And thank you to everyone joining us this evening. I'm excited to hear from our guest, mostly because it's a conversation in support of gender equality that's being directed by our male allies. They're going to tell us about how they support and advocate for us within their communities professionally and personally. Just a few housekeeping um, things to share before we start. I would encourage all of our participants tonight to please engage with us in the chat below and feel free to post your questions. We have collated a list of questions we received during registration and we will answer those. We've shared those with the panelists and we'll answer as many of them as we can. But we will also be excited to receive questions as we go. So very often the answer to any question that starts with the phrase, how many women is zero. Let's take a few examples. How many women have been president of the United States, France, Mexico, Japan, my home country, Nigeria? Zero. How many women have headed the United Nations or the World Bank or even the Central Bank of Canada? The answer is zero again. And when that answer is not zero, then it's often a number that's a poor reflection of the proportion of 4 billion women and girls that we have alive in the world today. Only one in four parliamentarians globally are women. Only 8.2% of Fortune 500 companies are headed by women, and only six women make up the CEO list of the FTSE 100. The gender pay gap in Ontario is still 11%, with women earning 89 cents on average for every dollar that men earn. The number is 82% when we take it holistically globally. Since the Nobel Prize Awards was started in 1901, over 900 individuals have won a prize across the entire spectrum of awards. Only 53 of those 900 winners were women. So when the LITS team decided to create a male ally circle, we hoped that getting men in on the discussion would be a way to go about solving gender discrimination from a different direction. Hoping that men in leadership positions will be more willing to listen to other men, especially if they got tired of hearing women say the same thing over and over again. And so we called upon self-proclaimed feminists, their words, not mine, within our communities. And we continue to be outstanding, astounded by the direct by their dedication and commitment to the cause as you can tell i'm already excited what i found most profound was their willingness to speak up and the myriad of questions they had towards understanding the best way we as women could be supported with us today are four men from our male ally circle who will share their experience as allies and their journey towards meaningful allyship as they continue to use their voices and actions to break the bias and create a more gender balanced society. I will invite them each to introduce themselves and tell us what allyship means to them and how they each became allies. Aster, would you please kick it off? Tell us about yourself, how you became an ally and what the word means to you. Sure, afternoon folks. My name is Aster Ingleson. I'm a husband, uh, a father of three kids, two girls and one boy. I'm a brother um, and an uncle um, and a passionate technologist. Um, my father brought home a Texas Instrument TI-99 at a young age. And ever since then, I've just had this interest in technology, uh, whether it's coding, uh, design, just have an interest. So I have 20 years experience in technology, passionate about building teams and building teams the right way ensuring that uh, diversity and inclusion is at the center of the cultures that uh, we try to establish. Um, I enjoy uh, building high performance teams. Um, throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to work in finance, uh, insurance, education, and most recently media. Uh, currently the director of software development uh, for CBC Digital Products. Uh, in addition, I have a background in computer science at the University of Guelph, and I completed my MBA from the uh, Ivy School of Business. Um, allyship uh, is an important uh, cause for me. Um, as I mentioned, I have two girls. Um, I want to ensure that uh, what I do allows them to have opportunities in life, equal opportunities in life, no question about it. 
being a brother of, of two sisters, uh, seeing them uh, encounter bias, um, it, it's, it's something that's hit me deeply as well. So allyship means to me providing opportunities, whether it's close family, friends, or providing opportunities for uh, women uh, if throughout my professional career as well. Thank you, Aster. And John, would you please like to tell us about yourself and what allyship means to you? Thanks, Kiki. Good evening, everyone. Uh, John Collinson, uh, I'm the Vice President of Technology for Canadian Wealth Management at TD. Uh, allyship for me really started you know, with the model that my parents set for me and my sister you know, as, as a child. Uh, you know, they, they modeled a very uh, gender uh, equal environment in our home. And, uh, you know, it's been something I've tried to model from their learning for, for many years. Um, you know, I do, my wife and I do have two daughters and a son. And, uh, you know, certainly as they grew up, it was something that I worried about, uh, you know, was, was how to create an environment, you know, and do my part to create an environment that uh, you know, allowed all three of them to have the same opportunities. Uh, you know, my, my allyship journey, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm a firm believer that allies you know, the term ally is not a title you can give yourself. It's something that has to be earned and you know given by others. Um, but you know, I truly try to get out of bed every morning with the with the mantra that you know I'm going to do my part to ensure that everyone can get out of bed every morning and have the opportunity to be happy and achieve their own goals. You know, I can't make sure they achieve it, but if I can help create the opportunity, uh, you know, that that to me is is what success will look like for us. So, thank you. Thank you, John. That's an inspiring story. Jason, over to you. Hey everyone. So I am a dad of two. Uh, we have two boys, four and seven. Um, my background's in marketing. I run my own agency. We help e-commerce brands scale with uh, digital marketing. Um, for me, I guess this kind of started around last year when I found this report that talked about, you know, how hard it's been for like Asian women to climb into the most senior levels, the C-suite of uh, organizations. And it really kind of bothered me, to be honest, uh, kind of just seeing those charts and, and seeing them in that bottom right corner. Uh, and, and for me, it's just been this journey to learn more about you know, what it means to be an ally. For me, it's like not just believing in equality, but kind of just learning and showing action in terms of figuring out how you, you know, be a part of a solution. Um, I'm still, to be honest, going through that journey myself. I just joined the circle over the summer and, and I'm continuing to learn to, to be a better ally and, and figure out how we you know, make the changes that we all wanna see. Thank you, Jason. I, I can't wait to get deeper into that and hear more about your learning. Um, Brandon, I will say we've saved the best for last. Um, you have no daughters, but I have had a first row seat to your journey as an ally. Would you please introduce yourself and tell us about that? Well, thank you very much, Kiki, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Kiki, that, that intro was uh, very generous. Um, a quick background, I've been pretty much in the business field for my whole professional life. Um, I graduated with a degree in business, went into the field of accounting, uh, worked as an auditor for a number of years before going back to school. Uh, to pivot into the world of wealth management. So I, I worked in a rotational program for a number of years at, at RBC before finally settling into a institutional wealth management role. So uh, that's my professional background. Uh, with respect to what allyship means to me and male allyship, you know, I, I looked up a couple definitions and, and, you know, they all have these themes of, you know, advocating and standing up and, and, and being there to support your allies. But what it really means to me is taking an active versus a passive approach. You know, I, I think there's a lot of men that, that passively agree with a lot of these causes and, and they want to get involved and they want to help where they can, but they don't know how. And I, and I think, uh, you know, if, if you take an active approach, you're going to be a much more effective ally in, in helping women you know, overcome these obstacles. So to me, that's, that's what it is. It's being there in the trenches, fighting side by side, to, working towards a common goal. Thank you, Brandon. So thank you again to all of our panelists for being with us this evening. I'm excited to get this conversation rolling. I have been at a couple of male ally circle meetings and I want the audience to know that it's a packed conversation. There's been a lot of growth, even for us, the women who are just privileged to be in these meetings. 
So remember to post whatever questions you might have for the panelists in the chat and we'll take them at the end of the discussion. Thank you. So I'll start with you, Jason. And um, you spoke a lot about being an ally and how that has to do with a lot of learning for you. Could you share with us the most challenging situation where you had to show up as an ally for women or to speak up for you know, a female colleague or whatever that situation might have been? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think for me, to be honest, the, the thing that's most top of mind right now is more of an at-home example. So, you know, we have two kids, four and seven, and my wife has a pretty demanding job as well. And as much as I have this startup that I would love to grow bigger and faster and have aspirations of it being, you know, much, much bigger, I'm also kind of balancing out, figuring out how to be a good husband and a good dad and kind of prioritizing her career as well. Uh, I think I'm learning that, you know, it is a lot harder for moms than it is for dads in general, in terms of the career before, even like in terms of like people being worried to hire someone, maybe if, you know, that person might get pregnant or, you know, they're worried that, you know, they might not be there for a while to like, you know, during that time. I remember I had a colleague uh, a few years ago and she rushed back after like three months of mat leave. She's in the U.S., which is a bit of a different beast, but it just kind of made me feel weird about like, you know, there's, from a male perspective, there's not that pressure of, you know, what's my role going to be when I come back? Um, so just being aware of those things. And for me, I'm just trying to figure out how to find balance at home. I have less structured meetings, obviously, as, as a founder in startups. So I've been trying my best to like handle it. And the kids might write in at any point during this call by just like helping them with school and, you know, finding ways to, to kind of be supportive to my wife who is on calls and, you know, she has a demanding job as well. So I think it's been a tough couple of years for parents with, with COVID and that's probably the first place that kind of pops to my head uh, for, for this topic. Amazing, thanks for sharing that. Um, I think having a father as an ally is important to the choices and the confidence with which women go into society. Um, I grew up in a predominantly male dominated industry, patriarchal society. But you know, my father played a key role in the woman I am today because my sisters and I had an ally as a parent. You know, so we never felt we could not do anything because we were female. And you know, as I grew up and went off to school, I realized that that was a privilege, and not everyone, you know, felt supported. Not every woman felt supported. So it's great to see the work that you know you're doing with your children, your daughters, and making sure that they feel supported from a young age. And talking about families, you know, and allyship, parents, and all of that, I'll go over to you, John. Um, yep. I know you have grown children, but I'm yes. curious to know what allyship at home means to you. You know, I mean, before going into the workplace, what does it mean to you with regards to how you raised your daughters or, you know, how you raised your children as a whole, whether, you know, your son has grown up to be an ally as well. You mm -hmm. speak about how your upbringing helped, you know, frame your narrative as a self-proclaimed feminist? Yeah. So first of all, um, we raised our children. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't take the credit solely and neither does my wife. It's, uh, it's a partnership. And uh, my father taught me at a very early part of our marriage uh, to get rid of the word we or me. Uh, you know, it's, it's our house, our family, our children, our Right. It's a partnership. And uh, so, so, you know, that was a great starting point. Um, uh, you know, how, how we split, I'll use the term, the work or the accountabilities in our home, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily model what I would call perfection. We're still learning. We're still, you know, finding the right balance. You know, we have a bit of a unique situation in that my wife is retired already. You know, she retired in her mid forties and, you know, I can, I, I continue to work. So, you know, how we, how we model certain things is different, but you know, how we coach our children is consistent, right? Our expectations of my son and, or our son and, uh, and our daughters is the same, you know, they, 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 
all perform the same chores, at least the two that live in the house. One, one's now moved on and married, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they are all accountable for, you know, the dishes, the laundry, keeping the rooms clean, all of those types of things. You know, as we were going through education, uh, you know, there was no expectation in how we coach the kids around choosing, you know, their, their education path around gender lines or gender biases. Go do whatever you want to do. You know, the, the world's there for you. So, um, you know, I would say I'm still learning. You know, the, you know, uh, you know, we've been through a number of opportunities as I've, you know, become more involved in, you know, women in leadership, women in, in technology events, uh, you know, the lean in circle. I've learned to be, you know, a better feminist. I like that term. Um, and, you know, that has involved me having very direct conversations with my wife around how I can be better. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, a very quick example, we had a conversation a couple of years ago, we'd been married at that point, about 26 years. And I learned something in that conversation, you know, reflecting on my own bias that I didn't even understand from her in 26 years of marriage until we finally had that frank and direct conversation about it. And, you know, it's important we continue to have that dialogue and, you know, invest in our partnership, you know, as we go forward. Amazing, thank you. Um, it's interesting to see that the saying charity begins at home also applies to this situation, this um, scenario of male allyship, how, you know, how we also choose to raise our children or you know, our families, what we do at home also feeds into the kinds of adults that you know, children become regardless of whether they're male or female. Thank you for that, John. And so I'll, Jump to Brandon. Um, Brandon, it's interesting, like I said earlier on, I've had a front row seat to your actions as a male ally. Um, I remember having a chat with you at Union Station when I was applying to the bank and it started from there. But most importantly was a conversation you and I had, I, I would say last year before we started the circle, where you asked how, what you could do to support women more after we had finished organizing an event um, to support, to encourage more women to apply to wealth and finance, wealth management and finance. And it was after that chat that I told you about this cycle, this circle that we were setting up and you thrown yourself into it with a lot of passion, a lot of dedication, you know, co-leading the circle, um, joining the conversation and doing so much. And you continue to support women, you know, professionally like I said, I've had a front row seat to that. So can you tell us how you became an ally? I mean, I bring this up because you asked me how you could support women. I didn't come to you. So at that point, you were already an ally. And could you share with us what led you to have that conversation with me or you know, with other women um, that are in your community? I, I can't speak to that, but what led you to wanting to be an ally, but not just being passive about it, like you said, but going out to ask your female colleagues what you could do to become a better ally and how you can support us. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Kiki. Um, so I'd say my, my journey has been kind of gradual and over time. It, it started more passive and it, it gradually became more active. So uh, I'd say there were three real key, key milestones. The first one being when I went back to school to do my MBA. Um, I knew that there was, you know, there were issues that women faced in the workplace and, and at home, and there were challenges that, that they faced that a lot of men didn't face. But I knew that I had blind spots. I didn't really have the details. So I joined um, an organization at U of T. It was called the Women in Management Association. I, I, they have a branch organization called We Men for Male Allies. And I joined that really as just a sense to cover my blind spots. I wanted to know what I didn't know learn more about the challenges, learn more about the obstacles. So, so that was kind of my first passive step in, into learning more about this issue. Um, the second step came, um, it was after I graduated and I joined the bank and I joined this rotational program. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be involved in the recruiting process and, and you know, the bank was very good at encouraging diversity. And so having learned about a lot of these issues from school, um, I wanted to volunteer in some of the women in management events that we hosted. This is where we'd get some of the senior leaders at the bank to come and speak about their success stories, their challenges. And um, you know, they would present to our, our women candidates and, and they would help us attract great talent. 
So my second step was to help coordinate that event and, and pull in you know, some of the speakers. And I thought that that was at least me contributing some way, taking more of an active approach. And, and that kind of ties into the final milestone, which is what you said, Kiki, is you know, I felt that I had taken a, a small step in helping organizing these events, but I wanted to know if there was something more I could do. I didn't know if I was doing enough. I didn't know if there was something obvious I was missing. Um, so I reached out. I, I believe it, it was you that I reached out to. And I said, you know, Kiki, I'm, I'm, I want to get involved. I want to help, but I don't really know how. Um, is there something else I can do? And, and that's when you introduced me to Lean In, and then you told me about the circles, and, and that really takes us to where we are now. And uh, we've come really far, so I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Brandon. Um, and again, you know, to all the men in our, in our male allies circle, it's, you know, so much, I see so much courage in the questions you ask at these meetings and the fact that you're open to learn and you're open to be told you're doing it the wrong way or this is how you should engage with female colleagues or that's not what you should be doing. So, you know, that's really exciting. Thank you all. Um, I'll go to Aster. Hi, Aster. And, um, you know, recently at one of the male ally circle meetings, we discussed, you know, women and another layer of, um, you know, discrimination or microaggression that they face, which would be BIPOC and intersectionality, right? So, you know, often we've read that in the power hierarchy, it's um, white men, white women, black men, black women, where women of color are at the bottom of that pyramid. So can you share with us some of the additional challenges that you think women in certain groups, you know, whether racial groups or gender groups or sexual, you know, orientation, groups of sexual orientation face and in what ways we can support them? Right. And Kiki, thank you for the question. Um, and, and, and this is, it, it's certainly complex. Um, and, and what I'd like to share is, you know, one of the challenges that we face is that typically with allyship with respect to BIPOC intersectionality, we always look at it from an interpersonal relationship. So we think about it as a mentorship or sometimes sponsorship, as opposed to looking at it from a systems perspective. So if we look at it from a systems perspective, there are opportunities where we can address uh, various uh, uh, impacts to, to marginalized women or discriminated uh, women. Um, so for example, we can look at things like hiring practices if we look from a system perspective. This way we can actually uh, cover more women with improving our hiring practices. We can also look at things like how do we improve um, uh, one's ability to, to work in terms of where they work, so remote work policies. This, this way it makes remote working uh, more accessible. It, it makes it more open for others to, to join you at work when you have a remote work policy in place. In addition, we can look at things like our performance plans, but specifically tying in um, plans that allow us to address diversity and inclusion. And that we can ensure that hiring managers hold their people accountable by including various plans that help them to learn and, and train and, and hold them accountable to those plans to improve uh, inclusion and diversity, specifically for their, their, their people. Amazing, thank you. Um, a follow-up question to that for you. I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, it says that you're hiring. <laughs> So, you know, a question is, how do you eliminate gender bias in that process? You know, especially within your industry, which again, like, you know, most facets of society is male dominated. Yeah, thank you for the question, Kiki. Um, and it builds upon that hiring process that we need to make uh, more unbiased. Um, and where it starts, it starts with mindset. Um, you know, historically, you might hear something like, uh, this person wasn't the right fit. It wasn't a culture of fit. And, and when you, you break that down, there's inherent bias in it. So our mindset is we're looking at culture ad. How can I augment the team? How can I make the team better? By making the team better, you have to look at what you've done previously and then change that. You, you've, we're not trying to follow the same mold in terms of how we've hired previously. We're trying to uh, add to it. We're trying to improve. Um, we fundamentally believe that to make better products, better decisions, uh, you can do this when you have a diverse team. Um, so having that mindset is a good starting point. But as well, Kiki, we have to look at things like the hiring plan itself. So right. uh, the job description, uh, how do you ensure that you're articulating specifically what it is uh, success would look like if you hire this role? Um, mm -hmm. We do things like we look at objective testing. Uh, so we use technology testing that's consistent 
across all different uh, applicants. Uh, as well, we define scoring criteria upfront so that it's objective. Uh, we know before we start interviews, here's how we're gonna assess our candidates. We're gonna look for these particular attributes. We're gonna look for a certain type of score and it's, it's standard uh, irrespective of who applies. Uh, we define question criteria upfront so you have that consistent interview experience going forward. Uh, as well, when we look at the job panel, we ensure that that panel uh, has diverse representation, uh, whether it's gender, um, uh, people from racialized backgrounds, want to make sure that uh, we have different perspectives when it comes to the interview process. And then finally, uh, those people that interview, uh, we ensure that they've gone through some form of unconscious bias training. It's very important for people to realize that we all have biases and then it's, it's a constant learning to address those biases going forward, especially in the uh, hiring process. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I hope the men attending this session are taking notes. So I'll go to you, John, seeing as you know, we've gone, we've moved away from um, allyship at home to allyship in the workplace, you know, and Astor told us about eliminating that bias in um, hiring or in the professional setting. So I will say to you, having earned the right to be called an ally by the work that you do as a seasoned advocate for diversity and equality, you've also actively supported women and been involved in a lot of our activities across different organizations with TD in the community, you know, ergo lean in. Um, can you share examples of how you have changed the conversation about strong female leaders in your organization? And um, hoping to pick out what women can take out of your experience as to how we engage with our male colleagues and how we can support our male colleagues or equip our male colleagues to help us carry on that conversation. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, there, there's a number of dimensions. So you know, there's, there's a few that I would put in the build, big building blocks. So, uh, you know, I got involved a few years ago in a committee that was championed by the group head that was leading the women in leadership uh, community at the time to help put together a program for actually training men on how to be better allies. And you know, we did some good work there. You know, that, that would be the large building block type scenario. And you know, we got that going and then COVID hit and we had to figure out how to refactor to not be able to do those types of things in person. And you know, so there's, there's some work going on continuing there. You know, but, I, but I think a lot of it isn't about those big, chunky, you know, not everyone's gonna get the opportunity to join that type of committee. You know, there's lots we can do in the grassroots, on the ground, you know, and, you know, just on, on how you model your behavior every day, right? Um, you know, I think the first one is just having a voice, right? And, and it took me a long time to recognize that I did have a voice and to speak up. Um, you know, we, we often forget that the voices that are loud about the behaviors we don't want to see and we remain silent, ultimately the silent voices are actually supporting the negative message, right? So, you know, just being willing to, to leverage your voice and reinforce the, you know, the allyship behaviors that we want to see around ensuring that, you know, that, you know if there's a woman in a meeting and she has a good idea and that, you know, that idea doesn't get heard, going back and giving that woman the credit for the idea and having her reintroduce her idea again to make sure it is heard, you know, things like that. You know, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, making it clear to people that I'm open to mentoring. You know, they still have to ask. I'm not running around, you know, trying to handpick the mentees that I work with. But I, you know, by having, you know, become approachable, you know, word of mouth has made it comfortable for women within, you know, the TD organization to approach me. And, and I, you know, I coach others to say, like, there's no, there's a, you learn a lot from mentoring and it's a bi-directional benefit, right? And a lot of people think mentoring is only the benefit of the mentee. I learn so much around just reminding myself of behaviors that I need to reinforce with myself just by continuing to have the conversation with various mentees over time, right? If I hadn't had those conversations, I may forget about something I learned five years ago that has come back to the front of my mind just through that mentoring relationship. I also had a unique opportunity and, and kudos to the young woman that approached me on this to have a reverse mentoring relationship with a, a younger Indian woman who came to me 
and and asked if I would be willing to approach it. And my first question to her is, what's a reverse mentoring relationship? Because I had no idea. But it was probably one, if not the best mentoring experience I've ever had, because she really taught me, you know, she gave me the opportunity to ask all the questions that I didn't have the opportunity to ask previously or didn't feel comfortable. You know, at. so, you know, what, what, you know, you know, what, what's it like to be a woman in the workplace? What are the things I'm not even seeing? You know, you know, the whole uh, intersectional conversation about being an Indian woman in the workplace and, you know, helping me understand the cultural differences of, you know, Indian culture and what influence that may have on the choices that you know, an Indian woman may want to make in, in the balance between their professional life and their personal life. And I, and I think, you know, that's the other thing we have to recognize it is a balance and it's not a you know as we look to remove unconscious bias and other things from our thought process that doesn't mean that we want to remove people's identity you're still indian or you're still a man or a woman or uh, you know transgender right however you identify there's many dimensions of your identity and this whole conversation isn't about having anybody's identity change but rather us being an ally to people regardless of their identity and making sure that we're treating everybody equally in that situation. That's packed. Thank you, John. You know, that's a lot of learning and a lot of self-awareness. Um, thank you for sharing that and, you know, being candid about your experience. I'll pivot a little, you know, seeing as you touched on that experience about being reverse mentored by um, a female colleague, I'll go to Jason. So Jason, um, what I gather from all of our panelists this evening is that you're self-aware and you're also willing to learn and support women because you're all allies. How would you go about recruiting men who are not allies and who do not recognize their privilege? How can men be more deliberate in their actions towards allyship? Yeah, so I think of that first in terms of just like who I would approach. So if there's five people in a room and person number one is the biggest DEI advocate and person number five is the most sexist, racist a-hole that you've ever met. For, for me, it's I'm not trying to make person number five like a 4.8 and wasting my breath and effort over there. For me personally, it's finding those people that are like twos and threes who are similar to me that are just like, we want to help. We want to do something, but we just don't know what to do and what we can do. And for me, it's just figuring out how to share some of this learning that I'm kind of picking up through this group and, and other things um, to kind of expand those people that are more neutral but want to do something. Uh, I can give an example. So that report that I mentioned earlier about like underrepresentation, like I shared that with a lot of people and with a lot of friends and a lot of different uh, folks that I come across. And one of my friends who's, he's also male, he actually brought it to his ERG group at work and they started talking about, you know, putting an index around capturing data around what representation actually looks like at their organization. So it's just like small, for me at least at this point, little things like that where how can I help drive awareness? How can I help drive a little bit of action um, from the people in my network that you know want to do something and, and want to get involved. Amazing, thank you. So talking about, um, well, from your response, what I see is women also have to come to terms with the fact that not every male is ready to be an ally. Not every male is ready to speak up, advocate and do the work. So we also need to identify those who are ready, willing to do the work and you know, reach out to them and encourage them you know, towards becoming allies. So um, I'll take a question from the audience that ties into this. And Brandon, that one's for you. Niha would like to know how these conversations sound in a male ally group. So you know, in, in that circle, when we're having these conversations, is it difficult to convince other men to start thinking in the way that members of you know, our male ally circle group are thinking. So how do you marry, you know, this group of men who are, who are allies just like you are and say men at the workplace who may or may not be ready to have that, those conversations? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thanks for that. 
Um, well, what I'd say is by the time we're, we're having the conversations in the circles, um, kind of going back to Jason's points, everyone in the circle already has come in with a, with a dose of humility and they want to learn and, and they have an open mind and, and they want to learn how they can help. So we don't have any fours and fives and, and not many threes. Everyone is, you know, in the one, two, three range and, and they want to help. So these kind of conversations aren't really that difficult. Um, really, at least from my own personal experience, I find it's more bridging those information gaps. I mean, there's, there's a ton I've learned through these circle discussions about issues that I, that I never knew about before. So it's less about having a difficult discussion and more about identifying what are these issues, what are these challenges, and, and really what can we do to address them? Because again, it's, it's not just male allies discussing in these circles that are, gonna have, that are gonna find the solutions to these issues. We need the help of women. And, and when we discuss some of these issues, we wanna reach out to the other women that are part of Lean In, the women in the workplace and figure out what can we do to help. So, you know, that kind of comes full circle. The discussions aren't difficult. It's more just sometimes a challenge to figure out what is the best solution. Right. Thank you. And so a quick follow up to that is, um, do you have any recommendations as to how women can engage male colleagues in this conversation? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, again, speaking from personal experience, I'd say the first thing you can do is, is just reach out. Um, I, I think you'd be surprised how many men in the workplace and, and in your personal circles want to help out, but just don't know how. I mean, I was certainly in that camp for a very long time. And, and it only took a very small amount of initiative of, of me reaching out um, to, to get very involved and, and get involved with Lean In. So um, if, if you're not sure how to engage men, I'd say step one would probably be just reach out and ask. And, and step two, I mean, if, if you are hesitant to reach out to people, you don't want to approach them blindly, you're not quite sure if they're ready to get involved, um, you know, this is a good plug for Lean In. I mean, reach out to Lean In. We have a, a growing circle of men that want to be allies, that want to help out. Um, we're looking for ways to help out. So if you don't want to reach out to someone directly in, in your own personal circles, reach out to Lean In and, and they'd be happy to connect you to, to one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Asta and it's from Neil and Lisa. Thank you for posting your questions. Um, they say they love the scoring being defined upfront, but do you do any back testing and fit testing to see if there is unintentional bias in the scoring pattern? Objective scoring is awesome, but they've seen um, they've seen it mass they've seen it become a mask for real bias as well. Keeping it out of the system requires constant retesting for objectivity. Mm -hmm. mm, no, that's a that's a good question. Thank you for that, Kiki. Um, you know, I can honestly say that we we haven't done any type of back testing just to validate uh, if there are if there's any built-in bias within the scoring criteria. Um, what I can share though is. We do review the scoring criteria just to ensure that uh, it, it's reflective of the candidates that we're looking for and that mm -hmm. um, it, it is up to date. Um, and then as well, we do uh, offer where uh, other hiring managers are able to offer a perspective and review that scoring criteria itself. Um, so, you know, our hope is that through that, uh, we're able to identify where, where there is any type of uh, uh, inert uh, bias. But I think that's a, a really good suggestion. And I'm, that's something that uh, I like to take away. Because as, as my colleagues have mentioned here, that we are constantly learning. So I think I've just picked up some valuable insight that I'd like to apply and, and figure out how we can back test uh, some of our scoring criteria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jason, here's a question for you. Um, and um, John, please feel free to chip in after. What has been your biggest learning being a member of the Leaning Male Ally Circle? What's your greatest takeaway? Jason, you might be on mute. He's good. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me? I just had to unmute. You know, I think my biggest learning is just understanding my own privilege. I, I think it's hard to even answer that question because I think most people's immediate reaction is all the things and all the challenges that they come across and not necessarily all the things that they have going for them in terms of privilege. So for me, kind of going through this group and, and kind of learning more, it's just coming more to a realization of, of the different privilege that I do have being a male. Um, and you know, just being aware of that, and and for me, 
figuring out how I use that privilege in a way to, to kind of help, um, you know, women in, in both, you know, in, in my personal family and also, you know, in the workplace. Thank you. John, do you have any thoughts to add on yeah. to that? I, I think, I think the, you know, certainly from the circle that, that I participate in with, with you folks on Lean In, you know, it's reaffirming that you know, there is a larger community out there of people that want to make that difference, first of all. You know, we're all on a different, you know, different stage of our journey around, you know, how, learning how and how. But I think the important part is it starts with this circle and then, a, you know, split the cell, so to speak. And, and the more that we can, you know, expand the network, the more that, the momentum builds towards this being acceptable from a men continuously acting as allies every day, right? And I, you know, what I've learned in dialogue and conversation with male colleagues in TD and just in the community in general is the biggest hurdle I think we have at the moment is them being comfortable with their own skin around, you know, I'll call it breaking the bro code for lack of a better term, right? You know, it's, it's, in my mind, it's, it demonstrates greater strength to be able to stand up for humanity as a whole than it does to just stand up for men, right? And, and we're only going to get past that hurdle when we can, you know, to Jason's analogy of the ones to fives, we can start by getting the ones, twos, and threes to become the louder voice than the fours and fives. That momentum starts to cascade itself very quickly and uh, you know, we've all learned about how diseases traverse in COVID. Well, if we can, you know, take that same, you know, mathematics and start to have, uh, you know, allyship uh, towards women cascade in that same pace, you know, th this, uh, you know, the, the support that we need to have in place to allow this to become mainstream much more strongly than it is at the moment, uh, you know, is, is, is a key factor. And it comes from starting the conversation, getting people comfortable with having that conversation, allow those men to find their voice comfortably. And then, you know, you know, still, still, they, they still got to challenge themselves every day. This is, this isn't, you know, we acknowledge the unconscious bias. We have to unlearn and continue to, um, to remind ourselves to unlearn because it's not going to go away overnight. You know, I'm 50 years old. There's 50 years of things. The influence has, you know, has raised to me, right? You know, yeah, I had great parents, but the rest of the community around me, you know, taught me other things. And, you know, that continued reinforcement from our peer group through that network becomes, you know, the louder voice rather than the quiet voice. Awesome, thank, thank you for that, John. Thank you so much. And so um, I'll, one, one last question, and this is open to, you know, all of the panelists, right? Um, can you share, actionable steps that men can take towards being allies. I like to think of allyship as a verb, not a noun. So it's an action word. You know, it's something that you do. What tips do you have to share with our audience tonight? What can they do to be actionable allies? Or what can they share with the men, you know, in their communities, in their lives towards encouraging them into becoming allies? And anyone can take this. I'll start. Don't don't you know? Don't wait to be asked, right? You know, this is something you can start on your own. Uh, you know, get out there. You know, start the conversation. You know, for, you know, most of us have women in our network that we need. You know, that we can trust to learn from. Start by asking the questions. You know, to uh, Brandon's point around how can I help. You know, uh, you know, that's how I got involved with women in leadership at TD is I asked a similar question. And, you know, once once you open the door and make it aware that you're willing to be uh, you know, part of the conversation, the rest naturally cascades. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in and, and say that in our um, monthly male ally circle discussions, we typically try and end each meeting with takeaway tactics. You know, what are some objective tactics that we can apply um, to make a difference? And without going through too many of them, one I think that was mentioned already was 
you know, give public credit to women and, and make sure that if they come up with a great idea, that that idea is heard. Um, this one is so easy to do. You know, I was just working on some slides the other day and one of my uh, female colleagues, you know, she contributed to at least half the deck. So, and she said, here, you can send it to the boss. I made sure, you know, said, hey, Amelia did a great job. She updated all these slides. You know, it's, it's giving that kind of public credit. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other takeaway tactics. tactics. I won't hog them all, um, but it's really just the small things that make a big difference is what I found. Thank you, Brandon. And on behalf of all the women here, I will ask that our male allies, please stop interrupters when they interrupt us while we're speaking. You know, that is a pet peeve for every woman. You know, when men colleagues tend to speak over women, it is, it drives us crazy. But I'm always thankful for the men in the room who interrupt the interrupter and say, hey, you know, Kiki was speaking or could we let Kiki finish? And I've also cultivated um, the idea, I've cultivated the approach of also interrupting male colleagues when they interrupt another female. You know, when they're done, sometimes when they're done interrupting, I say, well, you know, she was speaking, I'd like to hear her thought. And, you know, that's something we would find helpful, please. Um, and Brandon's led us into takeaway tactics, which is how we will be wrapping up the session tonight. So we'll take it from the top. Asta, John, Jason, one takeaway tactic, please, as we wrap up the discussion this evening. Sure, so uh, a takeaway tactic, and I'm gonna build on um, the question I was asked about allyship um, and what can you do to become an ally. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, listen. Um, so many times uh, when, when men are in a position to sponsor or mentor or work with women, um, we make all these assumptions and never ask, how can I show up? Uh, how can I support you? And it's so important to, to be there and be an active listener and then take direction. Um, and, and this makes such a fundamental difference if you truly wanna be a better ally. So I just, I'd offer that one of the takeaway tactics is to improve on listening to actually start off to be, uh, be, be moving on your, your journey to be a better ally. Thank you. John, one takeaway tactic. I'm gonna say read. And the reason I say that is there are some great books out there on being a good male ally. Uh, you know, there's, there's two by uh, David and Brad, uh, I forget the last, Johnson and Smith, I believe. Uh, you know, Athena Rising and The Good Guys, you know, they're both written in the context of helping us learn as men. I actually encourage women to read the same books because they actually help you understand what's going through in our minds as men. Uh, and, you know, may help you help us better, but uh, great books. Uh, I read the first one on a vacation one time. I couldn't put it down for like seven days of the holidays. It's just uh, take the time to educate yourself. If you're not comfortable having the conversation, go teach yourself privately to get yourself to the confidence level. Thank you, John. And Jason, wrap it up for us. Yeah, I would just say uh, speak up. Be, be that second person in the room, right? Whether it's the example you gave Kiki or it's an example of, you know, a, a male first um, taking somebody's idea and maybe summarizing it as their own, just speak up and, and be willing to kind of give that other person credit and say something like, you know, I think Kiki mentioned that earlier. Um, I, I would just kind of leave with that in terms of just being willing to speak up more. Thank you, Jason. Um, to the audience, please feel free to put your one takeaway tactic from this discussion with our male pa panelists tonight in the chat. We would love to see that. We will also be answering any questions that we've not had the time to answer tonight. And when we send out the event survey, we'll send out the answers to those questions. Because Kiki cannot resist the urge to put a plug for all my females all over the world, the other thing is to please not man explain your female colleagues. When a woman shares a thought, trust me, she knows what she's saying. Do not turn it into your words and try to, try to explain what she's saying. What a great conversation tonight. And Kiki just did a, an awesome job um, bringing you all together and moderating through that. I have so much respect for 
um, the way that that was handled, the contribution they made. Now, know that these are men who have elevated male ally skills. This is a journey, and I want you to always remember that you can't call yourself an ally. The group needs to call you an ally. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And if you're talking about women when they're not in a room in a, in a proud and an accomplishment celebrating way, that is a great start to being an ally, as is sponsoring them for jobs, as is tapping them on the back for project opportunities, helping to put your hand up. Mindo put their hand up for non-promotable work, but the non-promotable work has to get done. So when you notice that a woman is putting your hand up too much or being uh, voluntold to do that work, that is a great time to step in and maybe come up with different options. There's so many things. We would love to have you be part of that conversation. Um, email us at Toronto at Lean In, uh, Toronto at LeanInCanada.com. We're happy to continue that conversation. And a survey, of course, will be sent out to you. And I want to thank you for your time tonight.